What is sacred space? Why is it important for understanding the Bible? And why is it more complex than most Bible readers appreciate? Find out on this episode of Ancient Egypt and the Bible. The Bible is full of religious language. It talks about temples and religious ritual. The purpose of that religious ritual was to allow men to enter into sacred space to interact with the gods. This subject is important because so much of the Bible's ritual language comes out of this understanding. For example, you cannot grasp the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden without understanding its symbols. Even understanding temple ritual is difficult without understanding how sacred space works. Okay, the best way to understand the difference between the sacred and profane is best described using an analogy. Let's say you wanted to go into outer space. You could load yourself into a cannon and launch yourself into orbit. And let's just say for the sake of argument, you, ex- you survive the explosive compression of the cannon and make it into orbit. Once you're in orbit, you are likely to freeze from the lack of heat fry from the radiation, asphyxiate from the lack of oxygen. In short, the environment of outer space is not suitable for human life. When we send somebody into outer space using, say, a rocket ship or a space capsule, what we are actually doing is creating an environment that's suitable for human life that is then sent into outer space, but takes the environment of Earth with it into orbit. That way, the people in the capsule survive the experience. In a similar way, what sacred space is, is it is creating an environment that is, a, that is suitable for holy beings. It has to be clean. It has to be pure. Rituals have to be applied to make the space appropriate for a god or a divine being. Now, in our modern language, we would call this a field effect. Let's say you enter a room where the temperature is 20 degrees lower than outside. You feel the effect confined to that room. It's colder. You're sensitive to the temperature change. There's a effect that's just sort of in that room, but not outside of it. And as soon as you exit the room, you feel the heat. Let's say that room has an air conditioner. That air conditioner is creating a lower temperature just in that room than, say, outside of that room. What the people in the ancient Near East did was they would create areas in temples that had icons that magically created certain effects that were suitable for divine beings. Now, one of the things we have to understand is that each of the icons that were used in the ancient Near East had a unique significance and magical power. As a result, ancient people did not just have one kind of sacred space. Now, we kind of think, okay, you know, there's holy space and there's unholy space. But people in the ancient Near East had a lot, they weren't dealing with black and white. They were dealing with a color palette of different kinds of sacred space. Now, we do understand that the base type of sacred space created purity. And I've mentioned this frequently. And icons that are commonly used are seraphim and cherubim. Now, the seraphim keep a space pure by spitting out fire and burning any impure thing that 
attempts to enter the sacred space. Conversely, cherubim symbolize purity because they pick out stray impure bits that make it past the seraphim. And together, the seraphim and the cherubim create a cohesive kind of pure holy space. But in other cultures, for example, e ancient Egypt, the Egyptians had other kinds of sacred space. For example, if they decorated a sacred space with the Ankh, it was meant to promote life and living things. If they promoted it with the Min symbol, this was meant to convey stability. If they decorated it with the Neb symbol, it was to, meant to emphasize lordship and majesty. The Jed symbol, dominion, ma'at, order and lawfulness. And there's others. There's many, many other symbols that were used to define sacred spaces in ancient Egypt that conveyed specific kinds of, of magical effects. So there's a whole palette here of pastels that the Egyptians used to create sacred space. This is why, for example, the sides of sacred furniture were covered in these symbols because they created discrete effects that added specific kinds of sacred space that had certain effects. Moreover, the Egyptians could manipulate sacred space in other ways. They could put a sacred space on the lids of a box to create vessels of sacred space. Now, they did this often when they wanted to, for, for example, let's say you brought offerings. You had unclean figs. You're a fig farmer. You bring figs to the temple and you want to give your figs to Amun Re. Well, they're impure figs. They were grown out in fields somewhere. There might have been oxen out there doing their business and they're not clean they're not fit to be presented to the gods so what they would do is they would take these figs you know and there'd be a usually a window on the side of the temple there was a window on the side of the temple that they would accept these offerings and they would you know the, the farmer would come up they would pass the through the window give it to the priest the priest would take it put it into one of these boxes and put a lid on this box that had a uraeus frieze. Now, the uraeus frieze was the Egyptian analogous symbol to the seraphim. And then they do their incantations, carry that box to in the inside of the temple, open the box, and then pull out sacred figs. They were magically converted from impure to pure figs. But there was great virtuosity in how they could adapt these sacred spaces. They not only could adapt them onto boxes, and really very, sometimes very small boxes, you know, boxes that were sometimes only, you know, a few inches uh, in all directions. But they also adapted these symbols for beers, the chest that would carry the dead to their tombs, they would add them onto coffins, and they would even add them onto the thrones of kings so that even the king became protected in a field of sacred space. They also could multiply the effect of holiness and sacredness. And how they did this was they would put one holy space inside of another to create a more holy space. Nesting these spaces inside of each other was how they created Holy of Holies. So then when we look at the Bible and the scenes of the tabernacle, we see that there's not one, but two tents. You have the, the outer tent, but you also had an inner tent. And inside the inner tent was the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. Even in the temple in Jerusalem, you had the, the three courts. You had the, the court of the women, the court of the men, and the court of the priests. But inside the court of the priests was the temple itself 
And inside the temple itself was another section of sacred space called the Holy of Holies that was surrounded by a veil. Each layer of holy space added multiplied holiness. So we see these, like for example, these various effects even used in scripture. So even in scripture, we find that holiness and sacred space are not only, say, defined by iconography, like we see in, say, Egyptian sacred space, for example. Cherubim are used on the tabernacle to show that the tabernacle is holy. But we also find some interesting references to other kinds of holy space, too, like Ezekiel 28.14 mentions a place in the heavenly realm that is described as the stones of fire. It's not on earth. It's in the heavenly realm. But it is described as stones and fire. So it is qualitatively different sacred space. So even in the Israelite scriptures, we do find that there isn't just one holy space. There's several kinds. And we're going to go more into this into the next video on, that we are going to release. So anyway, I hope you found that interesting. I hope you learned something. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time on Ancient Egypt and the Bible. <music>